Good morning. I wanted to welcome all of you out there in YouTube land uh, all across the universe. Um, my name is Mr. Eric. Call me almost whatever you want, except for late for except for late for breakfast, supper, and dinner. So basically, what what my channel or what I like to talk about is famous people from history, not not just one particular time spot more than any others is one of the things, or take that back, two of the things I like to talk a lot about are American history and European history. I Right now I'm in the middle of uh, studying a little bit about Napoleon. I, I was really fascinated by him um, after the first um, lecture. What? Sorry, after one of the very first lectures I had, um, after I got my butt back in school, and I kind of felt like I, I kind of felt my calling from it. So, um, part of talking about Napoleon. I've had, I'm trying to figure out how to put other videos that I've talked about Napoleon from his uh, supposed nemesis arch rivals, um, Alexander I of Russia, uh, Joseph II of the Holy Roman Empire slash Austria. Uh, let's see here, William Frederick III, fourth from Prussia, and the reasons why that they were important of what shaped the European continent during the time of Napoleon Bonaparte's time in power is that he literally went, sorry, take the, he, he literally went up against each and sing, every single one of them single-handedly and every one of those other countries that he went up against, they felt like dominoes, kind of like um, the countries that surrounded the, the Soviet Union in the late 18, sorry, um, in the 1950s and 60s that lasted all the way up till the end of the Soviet Union, per se. And eventually, I, that's part of my goal is I want to talk about some of the leaders in Russia slash Soviet Union about why Russia and the Soviet Union were very important in, in world history. But let's, well, I wanna continue on with my series about talking about people who were other leaders of countries or heads of armies for certain countries in the time of Napoleon. So, excuse me. To be the best of the best in which England was at this time, uh, can't help but talk about the Duke, well, Sir Duke, not that Duke, the Iron Duke, uh, Arthur Wesley, also known as the as uh, the Duke of Wellington, not like the beef or the steak or anything like that, but you just you had to be the best of the best to go up against Napoleon, what he did, and one of the things he was most known for in history is that he led what they call the Sixth Coalition against France. Um, enough for the, enough about that for now. So, if we talk about again talking about Britain. Supposedly the best of the best, we had uh, King George III, who was king of of Britain at the time when Napoleon was in was in charge of France. Well, basically in charge of all of Europe. Um, George King George III was one of the most uh, educated kings of Britain that they ever had. He highly educated. Um, he was known for writing. He was known for making music. He was known for composing music. Uh, writing is in like short stories, poetry. I mean, this this guy was 
the Jizzle, the bomb, whatever you want to call him. But he also had um, what you call Poroporia, um, which slowly, slowly, slowly started dri driving him crazy. But um, this was the same king of England at the time of when the colonies in North America were going through their little revolution. He was... His family was literally put in, put on the British throne because of their neutral stance on religion, religion before that time. And this King George, he was not Brit British by birth, but he was actually um, Hanoverian, um, which means that he was German. And this was the same King George that was that Prince Charles was related to in England as of today. So basically what he did is that he wanted the best of the best to take charge of the situation in Europe because he really, King George really, really, really wanted, did I say he really wanted uh, Napoleon out of power? So basically what he did, he, learned, he looked far and near for someone to, who was able to stand up to Napoleon he, at times he really didn't have to look that far because they had colonies all around the world. And they, he first noticed this guy by the name of Arthur. He's having tons and tons of successes uh, on, the, on the Indian continent where they had a big tea factory going, where they routed the people of India, literally exploited people there so they, they could grow tea leaves to ship, those, to ship that tea around the world. And they, Arthur was known to be the strong, the strong hand of the crown, the British crown per se. Uh, he was very successful. Well, successful at a lot of things per se. Uh, nailing the cop, literally nailing the coffin on Napoleon at uh, Waterloo in Belgium. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, the French liberating the Sweden, Finland. Oh, let's see here. What else? What else was he doing? He was also a party leader of the Conservative Party in the House of Lords, which is the British version of the Senate. He was also the majority leader of that political party. Uh, he was also secured um, Homeland Security Secretary of the Colonies in North America. Good one with that one there, Arthur. Okay. He was also Prime Minister twice in Britain, I'm kind of building them up because we're then I'm going to talk about a, a little bit more about Napoleon, and then we're going to come to a head at Waterloo. Basic, basically, in a nutshell, with all of Wellington's um, successes, that you get every every medal that someone could get while sir, receive some kind of honor from their bravery and battle per se. Uh, you name it, he, he got it. And let's see here. And basically what, what this dukedomship was um, placed upon him by King George III was the highest um, title uh, an ordinary citizen could hold at that time. Just to show how much the king really admired him for his for his successes and being brave. Um, so basically kind of like what I said before, just you have to be the best of the best to go up against Napoleon because Napoleon, well, per se was um, stubborn. He wouldn't back down from anyone. Uh, he, arrogant, yes, he was very arrogant, very full of himself. Um, was he smart? Yeah, he was smart, very smart. Um, kind of like what I, what I would call like too smart for his own good per se. And the same thing with um, 
Wellington. He was really smart, for, too smart for his own good also. But also what made him uh, King George's top choice for leading this coalition is that um, he, he helped to break um, the French Navy per se, and they really, the French really didn't have a Navy. Um, it was kind of a pathetic excuse for a Navy. He went up against that blockade and he literally sank every ship off the coast of Spain to literally, li excuse me, liberate, supposedly liberate Spain from French control in which um, Bonaparte placed his brother Joseph in charge of. Um, basically everyone kind of ran for higher ground and they left Joseph there to sink or swim. Uh, he made his exit, well, kind of made his ado, kind of like behind this, off to the side where, you know, where he wouldn't be missed per se. Um, move on. That uh, another reason why Britain kind of like led the charge in this what they call the sixth coalition at the time too is because Britain and France had a big, 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 big rivalry rivalry going way back almost to the end to the beginning of times. Uh, probably guess probably probably like 12 or 1300s. Uh, there could be something talked about that then in the near future here too. Um, that rivalry still continues today in uh, politics and especially sports. One of their best sport, one of their most favorite sports in Europe is soccer. And that rivalry is very known widely and well between the two countries. So, talking about the best of the best and it did have some in, in France's point of view or Napoleon's point of view the best in Bonaparte's point of view did have some kind of a start uh, basically supporting oh come on No, move on. Sorry. Basically supporting a progressive view in France that was going on towards the end of what they call the very end of the French Revolution, the Reign of Terror. Everybody had their heads cut off. Um, Anyone that thought that, that they was uh, an enemy of France at the time, per se, uh, i.e. Um, this Robespierre dude, who um, Napoleon finally <clears throat> befriended and helped him to stage the, the coup to set up the council that became the stepping stone for uh, Bonaparte to come into power. And because of this, that um, Bonaparte was associated with Robespierre, he was put in jail for a very, very, very long time. No, sorry, for a short amount of time, he, being a political prisoner, that he was let out a short time later. I don't know what amount of time that really was that he was in jail. So, In, in a nutshell, that Napoleon rose right through the ranks, uh, being an artillery commander all the way up to the Empire, uh, Empire du France. Oh, he loved picking fights on with 
other countries in Europe per se, uh, kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, per se, Austria, which was a big part of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, literally taking the, what was his name, Pope Pius the Sixth. Uh, political prisoner to make demands of the Holy Roman Empire and in in turn that that they would attack France for some of their land and Bonaparte was well aware of that of what his repercussions were of the of the Holy Roman Empire attacking France um, Holy Roman Empire used the uh, help help themselves to the Prussian military because if they were the best of the best and they were routed by excuse me by Napoleon's military and in which in turn that Bonaparte took that to his advantage and literally cut Prussia off in half and used the what they call the Confederation of the Rhine the western part of of what they call Prussia Germany at the time to his behalf, on his behalf, um, knowing that Prussia altogether was not, um, would have been a very formidable foe. Um, and all of this kind of led up to what they call the Congress of Vienna, literally called out for his arrest because of he kept he kept sticking his nose where, supposedly where it didn't belong, uh, kind of on the whatever point of view that you looked at it from per se. So this is what I call like the beginning of the beginning of the beginning of a great downfall right here, is that he wanted to take advantage of invading Britain per se that was like really high on his list but he had a great he had a big disadvantage of trying to evade Britain per se um, Britain was so far away across the English Channel around 20 miles and he had to have a really good Navy and that was one thing that he didn't have he didn't have that strong Navy to help him give him that push to get to the mainland Britain So they basically got wind of what was going on. So they put some kind of a uh, stranglehold on Europe, of a blockade, a naval blockade around Europe. Um, so they thought that they could try to <clears throat> try to ruin France ec economically, per se, um, cutting off trade to France from countries from around the world and their allies. It, when I say it wounded or it hurt the economy of France, it really, really hit them bad. It kind of hit them literally like right by where it counts. In a very defiant, uh, very motivated Bonaparte decided that he was going to at this, around the same time as this blockade, that he was going to um, invade invade Russia in the middle of winter uh, in the month of December, which severely weakened his army because he barely made it back to France with literally the skin off the teeth of the skin, uh, very demoralized military. Uh, kind of set the showdown in Waterloo, what they call Belgium. Uh, he was sent into exile for about six months. Oh, drove him mad, even madder than he was, which kind of led the stage for a comeback. Well, you're, you're a famous person. What kind of a comeback do you think you're going to have? Yeah, he was... Excuse me, he was ready for a great big comeback, uh, what they call 100 days. I uh, escaped from the island of Elba, 
which is kind of unheard of. You were sent into exile. You were expected to stay and remain there for the rest of your days. Um, Eventually, he found his way back to France, looking to inspire and find new recruits along the way back to uh, La Grand Prairie. Uh, and along the way that he found more recruits, more people to fight for his cause, uh, he went. He made his way back to Paris, and he took out King Louis um, the... X V I I I V I I, who fled to Austria. Because his in laws lived in Austria, they, they gave him refuge. Uh, kind of said something about the Congress of Vienna being in session. And what the Congress of Vienna did was that they were trying to figure out what um, what countries were going to get back the land that France had taken from them, but they were kind of taken off guard by uh, Bonaparte being back in France, mustering up some more, some power, um, ruffling feathers, building up his military. Oh. Kind of wanted to show this Congress of Vienna as like who was in charge. Well, have you read any of this per se that fate would meet both of them per se? Um, and it ended up being on a battlefield a few miles oh, east of a small town called Waterloo. Um, the Congress of Vienna came up with a plan to build up this military to meet France. Well, at the time, they didn't know it was going to be Waterloo, per se, in it, the Arthur Wellingsley, a.k.a. Duke of Wellington, was going to lead the British and uh, some allied powers meet him by, excuse me, Waterloo. And uh, first von Weilstadt, um, which made up the which made up the majority of the military. Uh, let's see here. But not just this time is not just what. Sorry, what I'm what what I'm trying to get at is just this time. It's just not one country in particular going up against France because it happened before. One country would go up against France, and when they would literally get their behinds handed to them. Their idea was to merge all of the all of these countries together military wise the british and the and the russians would be a part of one army and like it just said the other part of of that coalition not army sorry i apologize was well, going to be made up of the bulk of the prussian army the best of the best going up the best of the best other countries that would help in this hostile, hostile takeover from the French per se. We mentioned the British, we mentioned the Prussians, uh, Russians, Austrians, the uh, Spanish and Netherlands wanted a part of this. So basically, yep, that's what they did. They all converged together and they met in Waterloo. Mm, which is about nine miles south of Brussels. Approximately, what, I'm sorry, about ni nine miles south, I just said. Uh, Brussels, per se, is modern day capital of the of NATO. 
So what Bonaparte's plan was, he was trying to divide all of the European countries so they weren't all together to lead it to his advantage. He wanted to take them out one at a time. Uh, Bonaparte's army consisted of about 300,000 men. And this coalition's force consisted of approximately 850,000 men. Um, these troops were very, Bonaparte's officers and troops were very experienced. And they were very loyal to him. But, but one of the downfalls to that that was in this battle is the communication was not very good. Um, and it started to rain and it kind of bogged down the French the French plans of the day. Um, their first plan was to, like I said, was to divide and conquer. He was his go a little bit more into detail, but I'm not. It's it was really hard to pick apart about what led to what. So I'm just gonna just try to sum it up a little bit. Is that um, he was going to engage the Prussian army led by this Monfier guy, um, take them out of the picture, and and which they did for the most part. And then it was on to um, Duke of Wellington to take out the, I'm sorry, Duke of Wellington and Alexander I to take out the British army and the Russian army. They were very successful against Wellington. Sorry, I had to kind of build up Wellington because supposedly he was the leader in charge of that whole coalition. He was one of the first to be literally taken out his army was taken out by Bonaparte. Um, Prussian army was almost taken out. Um, kind of along, kind of along the lines of what um, Bonaparte's uh, plan was back at uh, Jena and Austerlitz, which made Bonaparte one of the most fam famous generals slash um, world leaders of his time. He was about ready to get in there to defeat the rest of the countries, i.e. Um, the Spanish. What was left of that coalition, this, the Spaniards in the, oh, that's my spot. The Spanish and the Belgians and the rest of that coalition's force, per se, not very far, strate strategically located, not that far away from Brussels, per se. Which eventually they went, tried to engage the rest of the army, the Spaniards and the Brussels, um, into fighting that they were literally duped into being surrounded by that whole coalition and lack of communication. And the rain kind of bogged down the, the French army. Um, they weren't able to move around to try to counter attack the different sides that they were literally boxed in, even their way of retreat. Um, so Bonaparte had no um, no other way to escape because his way to escape was blocked off and he had no other option but to surrender. But did I say that um, one of the reasons why Napoleon was very successful to start out this battle with is that he knew how to organize his military as in snipers, cavalry, um, light cavalry, which there was a part of what made him, made his fighting force one of the best in the world at that time. But 
due to lack of communication and the weather, it was not his day to reign supreme in the sun. So he surrendered. Wellington claimed defeat. Sorry, Wellington claimed victory. Uh, Bonaparte surrendered and he was sent to the island of St. Croix um, off the coast of South Africa where he spent the rest of his days. He supposedly died from lead from a lead poison. So I want to thank you for joining in. You guys have a great day. Thank you.